Feature selection is a critical part of the machine learning lifecycle. It's where we go from lots of different features, select the most important and useful ones for our models. In today's video, I'm going to share a few of my favorite techniques, show you how to plot feature selection curves that show you how a model's accuracy changes depending on the number of features you have, and also share how to use some of the feature elimination techniques like recursive feature elimination. First, let's talk about where feature selection fits in in the machine learning lifecycle. Often we start with lots of data. and We might start to engineer some features that we're going to use. Now, as we start building all of these features, we're going to find that we don't need them all. Some of them are going to carry a lot more signaling in the modeling process. So there is an interplay between how we engineer our features, the smarts we use to pull information out, which features I pass into my final model, and then how we evaluate the model. And all of those are tightly coupled into a loop. Although I'm talking about feature selection today, it's very close to evaluation of models to feature engineering as well. So just because I'm distinguishing today, don't make it think that it's entirely different. I've put together this notebook that puts a lot of feature selection methods. I want to first acknowledge that a lot of this notebook came from some other folks' work. I used that as my starting point. I've went ahead and coded it down here on this earlier feature selection work. Now, based on that, I went ahead and supplemented it. Let me show you how. The original notebook really heavily focused on the MNIST data set. MNIST is great. It's a very visual data set. It's widely used. However, I'm not going to, in this video, focus on the MNIST data set simply because it's very useful, but it doesn't represent what a lot of us see in everyday life. The other thing is, I like to use a data set where I can cheat a little bit and know exactly where the signal is. So my preference here is to use the Madeline data science, the Madeline data set. It, there's a Python function make classification that you can use that creates this. This is a synthetic data set. So you can tell it which features are informative, which features are redundant, and then add a bunch of noise. This helps us when we work on feature selection techniques because now we know where the signal is. I've done a lot of experiment with feature selection. I often use this as a starting point. I've even modified this, added, for example, my own categoricals, other types of information, other loosely correlated information, lots of different techniques I've used along the way to generate these synthetic data sets as a way to test different types of feature selection methods. So that's why I'm going to start with this one here. And we're going to go ahead and create this data set of 40 features where only a handful of them are informative. You can see the five informative and then three redundant that I have. And this is what the data set looks like. It's all numeric. I'm going to keep it simple here for the first part. Now that we have all these features, we can start using feature selection methods. The first couple of feature selection methods here are univariate. They look at the variable by itself. Typically, I only use univariates in cases where I have a huge amount of data, a huge amount of features, and I'm just trying to parse down to something slightly manageable. Like if I start with 100,000, let me parse this down to 1,000 with something like a univariate approach. So while I have these in the notebook, I will tell you I don't really use them very often in day-to-day -day practice. Now the next one I use where we're starting to use a multivariate approach is logistic regression. It's a classic starting point for a lot of machine learning projects where you can quickly build a baseline model. And here I'm going to use the coefficients as a way to identify which features are important. As you'll see, we're going to compare all these methods in a little while so you can see which ones do better. But this is an easy starting point like that. Now, you can refine this. And a favorite of mine when I have really wide data sets not a lot of rows, is to use lasso or L1 regularization as a feature selection technique. I've used this many times before. It works really well on, for example, biological data that's very wide. What L1 regularization is going to do is it's going to take the coefficients and the ones that aren't adding signal, it's going to send those coefficients down to zero. So for example, here you'll see when I run this, 
I've went ahead and said, don't show me any of the features where the coefficients are not equal to zero. And now I've only got a handful of selected features left out of this. So it's gone from those 40 features, said, hey, these are the features that we think add signal to it. Runs very quickly, very efficient, widely used in the literature around this. The next feature selection method is using feature importance as a way to do feature selection. Now, you can use this approach with a variety of different types of algorithms, but when you're computing feature importance, my suggestion for my time and explainability is to use a permutation-based feature importance. That will then give you a ranking of all the features and which are the most important features. This is probably one of the most widely used techniques out there for doing feature selection to figure out which features are useful, which ones are noisy according to this. So you'll see here, we can quickly come this, get a ranked list of which features are important. And if you're paying attention to the numbers, you'll see, right, big numbers right at the front here, which are those features that we already know are gonna be more informative rather than these noisy features that we've added at the end. So you can see right away that the light GBM is on, on par here. Next is Baruta. Baruta is widely known in the feature selection literature. It takes an enormous amount of compute because basically it's creating and checking every, every feature against all the other feature combinations. So it's super compute intensive. I'm not even gonna run it here because I think it takes at least an hour on this type of data set to do. So I've used it before. It's an excellent technique, but does take a lot of compute time. So especially don't try to run this on the that MNIST data set that's in this notebook. Ugh, it'll take forever like this. So think about scaling this out if you want to use it. A good way to, again, experiment with this is use it with a smaller data set that, where you know the signal. You'll get more confidence in using a technique like this. So minimum redundancy, maximum relevance is another feature selection method. I personally don't have as much experience with this, where this comes into play is where you want a diverse set of features. So often if you use some techniques like feature importance, you might get all the features might all relate to one type of characteristic. But what you want is you actually know that in the field you want a diverse set of characteristics that your features represent. So using something like the MRMR can give you a diverse set of features like that. So again, play around with this, try this out as well. So now that I've built these out, I'm gonna go ahead and create a data frame that has all these results. We can write that out to a file, but what I really wanna do is evaluate and show you how these work. So let's go ahead and now I'm gonna take all those features, those rankings that I've done, and I'm gonna build a visualization to show you how the number of features relates to the accuracy of the model. I'm building this with this loop. You can see here, I'm controlling what are the intervals that we're gonna check the number of features, 40, 30, 20, like that. You can modify this for your own. And then we're building for each one of these a cat boost classifier. So we used a totally different algorithm than everywhere else. And we're gonna build and see what the accuracy is for this. So once this finishes building, you'll see here we've almost got it done. I can go ahead and give you the visualization. This is a powerful visualization, something you should really get familiar with. And there's some general tendencies I wanna show you in this. First of all, you'll see at, we've built this from starting with all the features. We can see what the performance of the models is with all the features. But as we reduce the number of features, we're getting rid of some of that extra noise. Remember, we know where the signal is. We're getting rid of some of that noise. You see the performance of the model goes up because of that. On the other hand, if we go too far and we remove too many of those features, that's some of the signal. That's some of the things that's giving us our accuracy. Then the model accuracy drops. This type of curve I've seen all the time in real world data sets, which is why I wanted you to see this with the synthetic data set. So you get a sense of, hey, it's okay to remove some features, but let's just measure it as we do this. So we have some idea if our accuracy is going up, or are we getting to the point where if we start removing features, our accuracy is going down. So once you understand this fundamental way, you're gonna have a good innate way 
of starting to think about doing feature selection. So now that I've got you thinking about feature selection, let's talk about how we eliminate or reduce features. We've already been talking about this a little bit. Well, how about automatically removing or eliminating features that aren't adding signal? And what we can do this is we can do this in an iterative way. And if we take a look at what I'm running here, this is in Scikit, I'm running recursive feature elimination where I'm gonna tell the model, hey, don't select any more than seven features. And I want you to build a model, look at the feature importance, remove one. Build another model with that reduced set of features, see which one is the least important, remove that. And I can control this with this step interval here. So this gives me an effective way to identify what are the most, what are the best set of features. And when I do that, you can see here, I get a model with a pretty good accuracy, 70.71, that's on par. Remember, this is only gonna give us the top seven features using this approach like that. And since again, I have what is the perfect solution for this, I can compare this with what is the ideal solution for this data set. And you can see right here, we're very, very close to the ideal. So this approach pretty much was able to find all the signal in this data set. Of course, in real life, you could make the data sets a little more complicated, but just helps us, gives us some baseline for understanding how this works. Now, once you get the idea of recursive feature elimination, if you have access to more compute, more, more algorithms, well, you can go crazy with this. This is what I did at Data Robot. We did something where what we would do is aggregate feature importance across a number of different models. So not just one model like we did with LightGBM, but let's look at a couple of different models. Then we get a lot of variation here inside of this. Now I'm gonna use this new aggregated way and remove the least important features that way. And so this was a technique that we built at DataRobot that had the AutoML, had the algorithms to do that. We called it feature important ranking ensembling. It worked extremely well. Again, this takes a lot of compute, but in our tests, that feature selection method worked really well. So experiment with yourself if you need to be able to do something like this. Finally, when I was putting all this together, I saw some other great solutions, such as I need to change the name of this, feature viz that's out there that looked like a promising solution. I had trouble installing it, but it looked like it automatically did some feature selection, helped you also think about um, correlated features as well. Finally, the Kaggle community is a wonderful place to learn about these techniques, to use these techniques. An early competition they had was the Santander customer satisfaction. You'll see lots of feature selection blogs related to that data set and resources because it was a very good data set to use for these types of things. I've linked in two other blog posts from Kaggle that I found very useful when thinking through feature selection. So hopefully those will give you more food for thought as well. Thank you all.